So that took a long time. This is like three or four days later. Uh, so I got all of those pieces through. I filled up these boxes. These boxes hold, um, I'll show you all the boxes here in a second. Uh, they hold 210 pieces each. And this many in this box, and I've done a few test pieces on the next run here already. So what I'm doing now is, uh, so this is the end result, is what I want. So now I'm, I'm cutting that little groove right there for the foundation to slip into. And uh, this guy wants a full side-to-side -side sheet as opposed to what I do for mine. Uh, this this to me is fine. Normally when I make them I'll do it like this, but uh, he's paying for this, so that's what he's gonna get. Uh, you get three, you get three out of one sheet of foundation this way. The bees build that out. They don't they don't care. They make a nice job of it. He really likes to have a full sheet, so he gets two out of a out of a sheet. And he can spend his money any way he wants. So tip the camera down here now and I'll show you kind of what I've got set up here. So just quickly you can see the boxes here of, uh, of top bars. I've got five boxes full. There's 210 in every box. So I'm shooting for 1100. I'll have spares because uh, I need all of those plus 50 pieces and I've got probably, probably 100 pieces. <laughs> That's not a lot spare, but you know, I should have spare. I've got a hundred pieces after I culled everything that I thought was too nasty, a knot or something in the wrong place. So I've culled everything that I thought should be culled, and then I have about 50 to 100 pieces left over. So I'll show you this here. You can hardly see the blade at all. Maybe from your perspective, you can't see it at all. That blade is hardly sticking up there at all. I've got the fence set so that that top bar runs right in the center over the blade and uh, it just goes right through there like that. It just cuts a very shallow little groove in that. So I'll run a few here and uh, you can see how this is going. So you can see that's exciting stuff. <laughs> it actually goes pretty fast. It's going to go at least as fast as the first round through there, cutting the pieces out of the raw stock. <clears throat> and that's good because, as I say, there's well in excess of 1,100 pieces. And it takes its toll. Boy, your, your arm doing that motion that many times in a row. You feel that the next day. But that's fine doing a nice job. You can really whistle through this stuff because you're already taking any off and this is a three horsepower saw. This saw will cut almost anything. You can see what a nice job it's doing there. And the camera has a hard time focusing. But it does a nice job. If you're doing any woodworking and you don't have feather boards, this yellow uh, thing here that's guiding it in. 
you don't have feather boards, they're not very expensive. You can actually build them if you want, but I think the the ones you buy, they're not expensive enough to bother. And they work really well. Uh, get some feather boards. This is a Milescraft feather board. It's a good feather board, but you can also get, uh, I don't know the brand name, but you can get the uh, the ones that have magnets, mag locks. Mag lock might be the brand, I don't know. And it, it mag magnets down to the table. <clears throat> Big advantage there is with this Miles Craft, sometimes I'm trying to use a feather board on a workpiece that's wider than the feather board will. You see the feather board locks into the miter slot and uh, so it, all, it can only go so far. Uh, so only go so, so wide with the material. With the maglock one, lock that down anywhere you want. And uh, so you could use much wider material with the maglock one. I think those are a lot more money though. This would be, I think, a really good place for a auto feeder. I uh, watch Bob's videos and he's got a nice auto feeder in his shop. And I'm, I know Bob and I'm not supposed to covet, but uh, I find myself coveting your auto feeder. I was going to buy one actually. I had a couple of really big projects to do this year. And uh, I really seriously was going to buy one, but I didn't want to get a cheap one. I, I don't like buying cheap materials, cheap uh, tools. They just let you down. They don't last and they let you down. So the one it wants about $1,200. It was just more than I could outlay at this point. Uh, but maybe I can put some of my wood shop earnings into an auto feeder. It'll be very, very handy for things like this. Uh, slicing up those, uh, ripping the top bars out of the stock uh, would have worked really well with an auto feeder because not only does it feed, it also keeps the stock against the fence, keeps your fingers away from the blade, and uh, that would have been really handy with, with doing that. But it's done now, so we'll move on. Maybe next time we do it, hopefully there's the next time, we'll have an auto feeder. And then this one too. And then I can just poke the little sticks in under the auto feeder and it'll just keep going through. And uh, I won't have to keep stopping to reset. I don't know that the auto feeder would feed as fast as I'm feeding, but there would be no gaps. It would just be consistent, or continuous, I should say. So that's about all I have to show you right now. Uh, after these are all cut up, then I have to assemble. I have to assemble 700 of them to start with. And I actually have to then interrupt before I do the rest to do another bit of a project. So uh, it's, it's a related, it's part of the project, but it's a, another, I just have to cut up some more material. So not a lot of really exciting stuff happening in the wood shop, just cutting, cutting material. That's 90% of what I do anyway. And then assembly sometimes, uh, usually assembly, but uh, there's an order for just pieces. So that's not gonna be any assembly. I actually got a couple order for just pieces right now, like a kit. You get a kit for a project and somebody wants to assemble that at home, but they don't have the saws and things to cut everything up for the raw material. So uh, I just build a kit do all the cutting from all the pieces so they fit together properly and uh, and they can put it together at home just like you would frames or assembly boxes or something like that so anyway that's all I got for now so I uh, hope you're hope you're enjoying just the monotony of this thing going back and forth that took a while to uh, mill all of these top bars I've got six boxes about five and a half boxes there's 210 in a box, uh, plus, you know, half-ish another box. So again, you know, we've got a basic piece there like that. Uh, rabbits on each end, in each corner, and then a groove in the middle. Not rocket science, but, uh, you know, it's 1,100 times through the saw. And more than that, because I made spares. There's quite a few I culled, because anywhere you run through a knot, on that piece of lumber. The lumber's really nice, but it's always going to have some knots. So you just, uh, you know, you don't want to put too many knots in that little top bar. It won't, uh, it won't hold up structurally. So next job, 
to make these minis <coughs> is I have to cut out the foundation. So I have made the bottom bars and I've made the top bars and I need to make that foundation. So this is actually one that I've constructed this time around and uh, there's two ways <coughs> to cut this foundation. This is medium black right cell. Um, it's not very common because there's not as many people using mediums for uh, brood chambers and so therefore generally medium foundation is yellow or white or whatever uh, but black is less common but it's not that hard to find you can usually special order it through your bee supply if you need it and that's exactly what I do I just try to plan ahead it takes them a week or two and uh, they're good to me that way so this is what I'm doing and this customer wants to have uh, edge to edge coverage on this foundation and that's all fine and dandy customers always right so that's what the customer wants that's what the customer is going to get but it is going to cost them <clears throat> because this way I get two of these out of one sheet of foundation this way I get three okay so you can see this kind of floats around in here a little bit that's not a big deal I just sort of make sure it's kind of in the middle when they draw it once they draw it it's stuck there I found that my bees draw this end part just fine I have no, no issues with it uh, yet so I'm content with that uh, customer wants full coverage that's all fine it costs you 50% uh, more in foundation because instead of two pieces out of a sheet I get three so it costs a little bit more it's not you know tons more the sheet the sheet of foundation is costing me Oh, depends on when I buy it. It'll cost me buck ten to a buck twenty-five, somewhere in that range. Um, so you know, you cut that in two pieces. Top set's like sixty cents. Uh, you cut it in three, which is like forty cents. So it might cost you twenty cents more a sheet uh, per you know per frame. But twenty cents a uh, frame. That's uh, you do a thousand frames. You can do the math. So that's what I get. I get two of those out of uh, one sheet of medium right cell and I get a little scrap piece. So I'll show you how I've got that set up on the saw. Uh, I've learned a few things so if you're going to be cutting this stuff on a miter saw uh, it works really great but there's something you need to know and I found that out the hard way so watch. Here I'm starting with the same jig I used to cut the bottom bars in two and uh, you know I've got a number of cuts in here now it's starting to <laughs> weaken up but regardless uh, put a little riser on here just to bring that a little bit closer to the blade and make a cleaner cut at the end here um, and in fact I've got 16 of these in a pack I would suggest if you're going to do this start start small until you get used to it because the the things to, a couple things to watch out for here are bring the blade down and the, and the guard doesn't swing back early enough so I need to uh, make a, a very shallow cut this way <clears throat> what you really need to watch for is normally in a piece of wood you would cut down and then through it and you can't do that with these if you try to do that with these and ask me how I know this when you slide that through by the time you get close to the end that blade is coming up through that like that and because these are laminations it's not a solid piece it'll lift this piece it'll catch in here and it'll go boom and head off across the shop so you need to cut this backwards to be honest you need to start in here if you do fewer of them I'll do fewer of them so I can demonstrate to you so I can I'm going to have to take a couple more out. That'll help demonstrate what I'm talking about. <clears throat> I just have to clear that fence. So I want to start here so that <clears throat> when it cuts this top one, the blade is going this way and not up. Whereas over here. And then I want to cut all the way through and come back. Okay. I'm going to do that now, and you can see. So, 
always good practice to wait till the blade stops to rise it up. Uh, it can catch and throw things if you don't. <clears throat> so that works really well. I've actually cut a number of these already. I've had zero incidents. I've had zero difficulties uh, with that method. So I'll cut this one again here and you can see it again. It's probably a good place to wear eye protection. There's little chunks of black plastic everywhere. You can see all through here. It's terrible. Cut these here. That riser I've got really should be wider. It's been working okay though. to rise the blade but uh, it worked out okay so uh, I've only got another oh only another 200 sheets or so to cut so that's not too bad So today I'm milling these end bars because what we start out with is an inch and three eighths end bar wide and when you put five frames in half a box so you have a, a standard box you put a divider down the center uh, standard 10 frame box I should say and when you put five frames on each side it gets pretty tight so as a, as a convenience measure I mill these to inch and a quarter, and this one's already been milled, and you can probably see the difference right from there. Uh, and it's it's a very very slight difference. It's an eighth of an inch, sixteenth of an inch off each side, and that's the trick. Is I can't I can't just cut one side easily through the table saw to make inch and a quarter, because then my groove is not going to be in the middle. I can't just cut these on the table saw and take a sixteenth off and then flip them over and take another sixteenth because then I have to adjust the fence. So I need to cut uh, 2200 of these. So I need to adjust the fence accurately 2200 times or I need to cut them all one side, keep track of which way up they are and then cut them again the second side. We all know that's not going to happen. So I made a jig. I made a sled actually I made three sleds and I'm going to show you how those work right now. Okay, you can see I've done a lot of cutting already. Kind of proof of concept, this is the first time I've used this kind of a sled design. And these are my these are my sleds. Pretty simple. I just cut those blocks out of a piece of 2x4. I glued them on there. <clears throat> I glued them on there very accurately, as accurately as I could that that block is is right in the center of this piece of plywood. The length of this isn't important. The distance between those is. And the size, these are sized very accurately. I'll show you why. What happens here is this frame sits on there. Some of them fit a little tighter than others. That one's fairly loose, but it stays in there. And in fact, it'll carry three. Okay, so I can cut three at a time through the saw. You can see the saw blade is raised quite a ways. And this sled is an inch and a quarter wide. And I can feel that the frames are wider than the sled. So what happens is I, I run this through between my fence and my feather board thusly. The featherboard keeps it tight against the fence. And then the saw takes off that uh, 16th of an inch off of one side. 
I flip it around, run it through again, takes the 16th off the other side. Now this is a this is called an L fence. I've got it clamped to my standard rip fence here. And the reason I need to run an L fence is particularly the first time through this frame is is protruding past the sled. Okay? So I need to reference the sled, not the frame. So I need a, a fence that's no higher than this. It's actually about exactly the same height as that, but uh, it seems to work just fine. And so I've done quite a, quite a few of these already, uh, but I'll do a number of them here to show you. And uh, my wife was helping me yesterday, and this, this worked really great because she stood here and loaded the sleds while I ran them through the saw and that timing was just about perfect she could unload and load a sled in about the same amount of time that I could run it through the saw twice so she was keeping up just right but you know alone I can load the three set sleds then I can run them through unload them load three sleds again and I just have a garbage can here off off camera and I just dump them in the garbage can and I can sort them into my little bins here later on. small difference, but that difference adds up over those five frames and it gives you a, a lot of management space in that new. So that gives the idea of what to do. Again, I have 2200 end bars, making 1100 frames, and uh, you know, <laughs> every end bar goes through there twice. Uh, so that's 4400 times through the saw, three at a time, divide that by three, and uh, it's still a load, of, a load of times through the saw. I really only have uh, less than 400 to go. So we're making making good progress on this. Mm -hmm. 